The first case of an infectious new Delta variant has been confirmed in Sydney in hotel quarantine. Victoria has recorded 2,108 new cases of coronavirus overnight. Carolyn, have you been watching this thing called Squid Game? Okay, sitting indoors and doing nothing again it is then. So, 2021 turned out to not really be all that different to 2020 after all. But at least we did get a heck of a lot more movies this year. I saw about 400 films in 2021, though that is counting some TV shows and shorts, and I say this not to brag, but because I don't have any hobbies. Last year, my video ranking all the films I saw in 2020 only covered 26, but this time I have 50, which at the time of my writing this, I am already regretting. Unlike last year, where barely anything was coming out and I got to check out things I would have otherwise missed, this year's saw me drowning in new releases and I barely even got around to the bare minimum this time. There's way less variety than last year where I had like anime and foreign films and this time I got like seven superhero movies and yet I still somehow had to leave all of these out. Seriously, there's enough here I missed for a video on its own. I tried something different last year by making an effort to avoid as many trailers and posters as I could for movies I knew I already wanted to see so I could go into them without knowing too much, which became a tad bit difficult when Twitter was keen on posting every single frame of the Spider-Man trailer. There'll be no story spoilers again this time and all of the footage I use will only be from trailers, but if you're trying to do the same thing I did and avoid as much information as you can, then I'm afraid this video might not be for you. Anyway, I should probably probably get onto it because I have so many movies to discuss and why am I even still talking? There's gonna be a lot of questionable film choices in here. This is just the beginning, okay? Easily the worst film I saw this year was the third chapter in the Incredible After Trilogy, which for those who don't know, are a series of romance films based on a Wattpad fanfiction about Harry Styles. How could it not be amazing, I bet you're wondering? Well, without a doubt, both parts of this couple are absolutely awful people, and it's really worrying to me how much these films romanticize and promote this very toxic relationship. But on the other hand, they're just so entertaining for absolutely no reason. It is genuinely a credit to the writers that they are able to endlessly come up with new arguments for them to have over nothing And then they have sex like 15 times in the span of an hour and a half Even the trailer is just 50% scenes of them making out They are in every single way absolutely the worst But they're so addictive and I'm so excited for the fourth one Absolutely awful film, I cannot recommend it enough <laughs> Okay, first off, I gotta say this is a pretty great year for movies if this was one of the worst things I saw. Free Guy is the only one on this list that I really didn't like, and I think it's because I find it very hard to watch movies that try to make sense of video game culture without making me want to cringe myself to death. The humor and characters didn't really work for me, and most of it just kind of came off like a 60-year-old executive trying to be relatable sort of thing. Is that a Glock in your pocket? No. What? It's two blocks. <laughs> so there is a lot of work put into the visual effects, and I did like the soundtrack at least. Seeing actual Twitch streamers like Ninja and Pokimane on the big screen though was an experience I will truly never be able to forget, and almost made the $20 ticket worth it. Almost. <laughs> So, in 2021, a movie starring both Bernice and Cosgrove of South Beach Toe came out, and as if I wasn't going to immediately watch that, it is actually impossible to figure out where the plot of Jerry Curls is going. It sets itself up with this trashy and dumb humor, but then it goes completely off the rails by the end that it's very hard not to enjoy it in some form. Although, I was disappointed that it didn't go far enough in terms of batshit nonsensical things happening. Like in South Beach Toe, Bernice plays a fucking jetpack and lifts a car with her bare hands, and that's just an episode. And Jerry Curls feels almost turned down by comparison. Big Chungus, Fortnite funny, wholesome Reddit moment, Keanu Reeves 100. As one of, uh, apparently 46 people who kind of liked the two Matrix sequels, I didn't think there was any way I wouldn't enjoy this. The Matrix Resurrections feels like a sequel that nobody really wanted to make, and it's very apparent the further the movie goes on that even it doesn't really know why it exists. Aside from the obvious. I mean, it's fine to have a movie be more focused on a personal journey, and I think it might work better if you look at it as an epilogue to the other films rather than a full-blown sequel. One of the major highlights of the Matrix films are the fight scenes, which remain a standout throughout the entire trilogy. But here they're just really sluggish and not very exciting to watch. I didn't even think the visual effects were nearly as good as the originals. I'm just really confused by the direction Resurrections takes. There are flashes of cool ideas in there, but they're tossed aside in favor of whatever this movie is trying to go for. But then I go and look at Letterboxd and every single review almost is like really positive. So now I'm wondering if there was some sort of meaning that I missed. The recasting of both Agent Smith and Morpheus was really jarring and they just didn't provide enough of a satisfying reason in the film to justify it being so distracting. It is really interesting to see how divisive the reaction of this one has been though and in that regard it sure is a sequel to The Matrix. The animatronic characters here 
do get a bit quirky at night. I feel like Willy's Wonderland should have been a lot more fun than it was, considering the premise is literally Five Nights at Freddy's with Nicolas Cage. Something I'm still trying to get my head around is this idea of camp. From what I understand, the point is that things are intentionally bad and cheesy, because that's meant to make it more endearing in a way. I'm not trying to be a dick, I'm being genuinely serious. Willy's Wonderland is undeniably full of camp, but I think it was just a bit too silly for me to enjoy. There's definitely some nice visuals in here that they got out of a cool setting, and they did make an entire theme song just for the movie, which is impossible not to love. I do like that Nicolas Cage is willing to be in these dumb, weird, lower budget movies though. He and his character are for sure the best part, but everything else about it just wasn't for me. Still looking forward to that actual Five Nights at Freddy's movie in like 2050. <laughs> The new Diary of a Wimpy Kid is only an hour long, and it goes by so fast that I'm not really sure if I did or didn't like it, because it just left absolutely no impression on me whatsoever. The animation was a bit more limited than I was expecting, and it's clear that they didn't give this a particularly high budget, and yet there are some scenes with these unbelievably high quality 4K RTX ray trace lighting effects for some reason. I never really got used to the animation style, and I was just staring at Greg's mouth for basically half the runtime, because once you notice that it moves around his face when he talks, it's very hard to look away. Also, Manny is absolutely horrifying in 3D. I remember them saying this was meant to be a more accurate adaption of the book, but they skip over a lot of the stuff that made it so good in the first place, and what's left is this stripped down version of the basic story. It also ends super abruptly without really feeling like it wrapped up all that much, but maybe I didn't enjoy this as much because it's just a retread of something I've already seen done before, so perhaps people who aren't familiar with the books will get a bit more out of it. The other movies did set a pretty high bar though, to be fair. Ah! I'm a bit stumped on how to rank Army of the Dead because I feel like this is too low. I don't think it's awful by any means, but I just got nothing out of it. With a premise as cool as a heist in the middle of a zombie infested Vegas, I was a bit let down in the character department. It's a neat mashup of ideas, but it turned out to be a lot slower paced and more character driven than I was expecting. But because I didn't care about most of them, that made it kind of difficult to connect and be concerned about what was going on. Let Kate, however, go down in infamy as the most evil character in cinematic history. Oh my god. I feel like with the marketing and posters, being so vibrant and colorful, I was a bit disappointed by how the setting of Vegas wasn't utilized all that much visually. I also wasn't a fan of some of the zombie stuff, it was a bit too corny for me, but I definitely can't fault them for trying something different. The action is great and the R rating is appreciated, but it was actually a lot more infrequent than I thought it would be. Like the intro has this montage that plays through the opening credits and I thought that was really cool. I just wish the rest of the movie had maintained that level of energy. I swear I have nothing against Zack Snyder, but this list is going to make it look otherwise. <laughs> Last year was kind of the peak of me finding the Fast and Furious franchise completely hilarious, so I was very surprised that I genuinely remember barely anything about this. Ever since The Rock and Jason Statham migrated over to their own franchise, I think Fast 9 is sorely lacking their presence. They were a huge part of what made them so stupidly entertaining, and unfortunately I just didn't think John Cena could carry that weight on his own. I don't know how to explain it that well, but even though this movie does even more of the stupid, dumb, physics-defying bullshit that the Fast movies have become so beloved for, it almost feels like they're becoming really self-aware of it, so that's making it less enjoyable, I think? For Nine does continue the trend of these movies having an unnecessarily well-written and tight continuity by bringing back minor plot points and characters from previous films, and yet their big explanation for why Han is back is like so half-assed. Like that's what the movie marketed itself around and they couldn't even be bothered to come up with something barely plausible. Am I going to be there day one for Fast 10 though? Absolutely. Oh fuck, how did this get in here? I assure you that watching a My Little Pony movie was not on my list of things I plan to do in 2021, but that very same friend who forced Zombies 2 on my list last year is also responsible, and yes, I do need new friends. And I feel like watching things with friends unnecessarily elevates the experience of any movie that you don't care about. The others before this just simply can't compete with terrible jokes being made every two seconds. I also genuinely didn't think A New Generation was bad. The animation is surprisingly nice, and I'm shocked that My Little Pony has a higher visual quality than a Disney movie. I kind of enjoyed some of the characters and there are enough ridiculous moments that it became unexpectedly enjoyable at times. And for a musical, I actually thought some of the songs were pretty good. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking before I embarrass myself anymore. Moving on. Yeah, the beach is a bathtub. I have no idea how to feel about old because it's such a bizarre experience. I think the premise is genuinely scary and they do lean into the existential terror of uncontrollably aging quite a bit to the point where it definitely made an impression on me more than everything before it on this list. But on the other hand, you have this unbelievably clunky dialogue where nobody talks like a real human being. I honestly feel like I shouldn't have enjoyed this at all, but so much weird shit happens that continues to crescendo throughout the film that I didn't know whether to be horrified or very entertained. Can you tell this one confused the hell out of me? I've got no idea what I'm saying. <laughs> 
Roger. Mm, okay. I'm going to be as brief as I can here because I know anything I say from here on out is going to be clipped and put onto a bad movie takes Twitter account with like 12 followers. I totally get what they were going for with the high energy and jokes in the Mitchells versus the machines, but I think it just came off as kind of obnoxious and continually interrupted the flow of it. I do understand that it's supposed to be from Katie's perspective and all, but I just didn't think that made it any more enjoyable to sit through. There are some genuinely funny and standout moments like the mall scene that absolutely killed me, but it was just drowned out by what I can most closely equate to 2012-esque lol random moments with a pinch of phone bad old person humor for good measure. Which is what I was expecting from the emoji movie, not this. Why is it a requirement that every movie about the internet has to source things from like 10 years ago? The visuals of course are consistently amazing, especially toward the end with the finale, and I love the stylized cartoonish approach. And I am very glad this one is getting a ton of praise, but it is one of those times where I feel completely left out and wish I got more out of this like others did. Okay cool, now that about half of you have left. Hey there demons, it's me. Yo boy. I can't exactly say The Conjuring series has been one of my favorite horror franchises, but I did think the second one was an improvement over the first, and I enjoy the characters enough to want to keep up with them. They do a lot of really cool effects and visual tricks in The Devil Made Me Do It, and though the antagonist and conflict weren't all that amazing, they've never really been the highlight of the series for me anyway. As with the previous two, the Ed and Lorraine Warren relationship stuff is easily the highlight. I know the people they're based off of are awful, but I could watch these fictionalized versions being a ghost hunting power couple forever. I did want to point out though that this series his obsession with reminding you that it's based on a true story really comes back to bite it with this one because when they show clips from the actual case it makes it really questionable what side the film is on. In the context of the movie it's a happy ending and all but in real life demons don't exist so it's kind of a strange message that the movie I think expects you to root for someone who's been acquitted of murder after using a supernatural defense in court. Like what? Okay, here's another one I'm a bit worried about, but please hear me out. Last year, I made a very brief joke about how I didn't like the script of King of the Monsters, and people got pretty mad at me for that, so I can't wait to find out what's gonna happen now. But there aren't dislikes anymore, so I don't give a shit. I have seen Godzilla vs. Kong twice now, so I think I'm very confident in saying that I cannot believe this took all of the issues I had with King of the Monsters and made them arguably worse. I liked the first Godzilla movie a lot, even with Godzilla forgetting to be in it, and I really enjoyed Kong Skull Island, because the characters in that are entertaining enough to carry the movie without the big monkey. But King of the Monsters, while maintaining the incredible visuals and monster stuff I love, was surrounded by these incredibly boring human characters who I just couldn't give less of a shit about. And that's a shame because that is a majority of the movie. My god. Godzilla. Godzilla vs Kong does the exact same thing and it's baffling to me that they've made two films now where they have like 20 collective minutes of incredible monkey lizard fights and then one hour and 40 minutes of just white noise. The actual Godzilla and Kong fights themselves are absolutely fantastic and blew me away with how good they are. I think they're definitely at their best in this one. But that's like 30% of the movie at best. The bits where it cuts to the human parts feel almost like ad breaks. Unlike King of the Monsters, this one actually has two different human stories to follow, and I think they actually compete to see which one is less interesting. I get why they need to be there. The movie wouldn't work on its own without some human element, and even if they're not the reason that people are seeing the movie, I don't understand how they haven't been able to make them anything other than just something to make the movie two hours long. Those very brief moments where they actually let us see what we came here to watch and there's no boring human characters or puns, these movies are incredible. I just wish that the entire film was on the same level of quality as the visual effects. I'm happy this one killed it at the box office and I'd love to see them have more tries at making these MonsterVerse films even better. I just hope they can improve what people have been consistently criticizing since the first Godzilla. Okay, now that like 70% of you have left. With The Gentleman being one of my favorite movies I watched last year, I was very excited to learn that there was another Guy Ritchie movie coming out in 2021. I've come to expect these very very stylish, charismatic movies from the few I've seen from him, like two of them, but I guess I forgot that he also makes yeah. other movies. Not that Wrath of Man is bad in any way, but it's definitely more of a standard action movie. Like sometimes you just want to watch a film where Jason Statham is invincible and kills like 10 million people, and that's fine, it's just not what I was after. I was invested for the first act or so, but it does jump around a bit with the story and timeline and just didn't really come together for me by the end. The action and shootouts are really well done, and there's for sure plenty of entertainment value just from that alone. I think I was just anticipating a more stronger character-driven story. Also, I didn't know that Post Malone was going to be in this and I absolutely lost it when he showed up. You can't jump scare me like that, guys. Knock, knock, let the devil in. Going into Venom 2, expecting it to be the shittiest movie of all time, I was pleasantly surprised that it was 
not. I really do not like the first Venom, but Let There Be Carnage is a definite improvement in every way. It's a lot sillier and more self-aware, and though it took me a bit of time to warm up to it, I actually enjoyed the Venom and Eddie stuff a lot more, but still didn't really take to anything outside of that. It's both genuinely and unintentionally funny, and some scenes are just so silly, I have to admit I laughed a couple times, but some of the dialogue, man, oh my god. Ming Wong. Being half an hour shorter than the first, I think it goes by very quickly, but it has really fast-paced editing as a result, with a lot of stuff feeling like it was left out. You definitely feel the PG-13 rating a bit more in this one, and it doesn't get to go as far as I think they would have liked to. But the biggest issue is that they didn't even do another Eminem song, so what was even the point? Trick or treat. Motherfucker. I was really looking forward to Halloween Kills, so I have to say I was let down by this after thinking the 2018 Halloween was great and looked to be headed in a cool direction. There are definitely some good ideas in here, and I do see what they were going for with focusing more on the effect that Michael Myers has had on Haddonfield, but I just think the execution could have been a whole lot better. I'm trying to work out how to explain myself without sounding mean-spirited, but it just feels like the middle of a story with no idea what to do but kill time and people until the last one. I did find an interesting comment on Reddit about it, but you know, take that with the sincerity it deserves, where they mentioned they were at a test screening where the ending was entirely different to the final film and other things that happened were meant to be a much bigger deal. And it sounds like from their description that what they originally had was really good. And then they changed it for no fucking reason. There's supposedly meant to be an alternate ending that'll come out with the Blu-ray release that I think is the same one, so I'm definitely gonna watch it again when that's out. And I'm hoping that'll fix most of the issues I had with Kills feeling so incoherent. My biggest issue though is one I really didn't want to bring up, but I talked about in my horror movie video that I don't like saying that characters make dumb decisions in horror films when they're afraid and being put under pressure, but Jesus fucking Christ, this movie felt like a direct response to see how far that could be challenged. I genuinely think that everybody in Haddonfield is a complete moron and Michael Myers is the hero trying to stop them from reproducing. Holy shit. This is the fucking dumbest movie I have ever seen in the absolute best way possible. I went into this expecting it to really scare me, but aside from a couple select moments, I don't think that's actually what it was going for at all. It is really hard to talk about Malignant without spoiling it, but it's just one of those rare few films that definitely becomes more enjoyable with hindsight. I haven't seen too many movies that have been able to just do a complete 180 of my enjoyment of it after it was already halfway through. Malignant takes a hell of a turn that I don't think you'd even believe me if I tried to explain it to you. You really have to bear with it, and it did take me a very long time to work out what they were aiming for with the tone, but after certain events happen, it does get there eventually. It's unintentionally really funny also, I'm not sure if that's what they were going for, but if it was, they nailed it. Still, with all that being said, I wish the first two thirds were a bit stronger, and even with the incredible third act, I do think it would have been better if the majority of it had been on the same level. I know I said earlier about how I still don't really get camp, but if this is it, then I think I'm beginning to get it. Bad Trip was good. I was really impressed with how they integrated unscripted footage of random people reacting to dumb pranks into a narrative structure that somehow ties it all together. Some of the jokes in here are definitely a bit too lowbrow for me, but I did laugh at quite a few of them. Though I do say this having not seen much of the Eric Andre show, so maybe people who have are a bit more used to this. I really have to wonder how many 911 calls this caused. Okay, I can explain. Or at least try to. I know you must have all been horrified when I cleared through all of the two and a half stars and this still hadn't shown up yet. I know that Space Jam and New Legacy is a big corporate advertisement. I know it's a huge dick measuring contest for Warner Bros trying to show off how many things they've bought. I know it's supposed to be terrible, but I had so much fun watching it. So many inept decisions come together to make something undeniably not very good, but thoroughly entertaining. The original Space Jam is unironically one of my favorite movies ever because I can't believe it even exists, and yet it's a creative of mashup of a ton of entirely unrelated things that somehow make for such a good time. But here the story is stupid and makes no sense and Don Cheadle feels so out of place and the villains suck and LeBron is really not a very good actor. By no means am I trying to suggest that WB bragging about how much money they have is in any way a better movie than everything before it here, but I definitely had a more memorable time watching this if that makes sense. A new legacy just does so much. There's a clear amount of work put into the sheer number of effects they throw at you, everything from CG to 2D animation. It's not lazy, I guess. Or maybe it is. I know putting this here takes away any critical credibility I could have ever had, but if you're here to take my channel seriously, then you've come to the wrong place.
In hindsight, one of the wisest decisions I've ever made was skipping the original Justice League when it came out, but it did mean that I had nothing to compare this to. I'm sure there's a different perspective to be had with Zack Snyder's Justice League when you were able to contrast what was added or changed, but for me, this was my very first impression of this iteration of the League, and it was okay. None of the League members really stood out to me all that much, but I was surprised how much I enjoyed Steppenwolf. I'm guessing he had a much larger role here than in the original, because I remember everyone saying how bland he was in that. I almost managed to watch this entire thing in one sitting, though I am but a man with a family who must call me every 10 minutes. I am sure others have brought this up before me, but I found it so funny that there is this one song they use for Wonder Woman that plays literally every time she does anything. This movie is four hours long, okay? It becomes pretty obvious after the 75th time. In spite of how much my eyes wanted to fall off by the end, I do think the ginormous length really helps build up the severity of the conflict rather than trying to condense this entire massive world ending event into two hours. I mean, can you imagine doing that? But oh my god, does Zack love his slow motion. The only reason this is four hours long is because half the runtime is slowed down. Tw 24 minutes. Zack, you have a problem. For the most part, this still wasn't really my thing with some silly scenes and dialogue that I'm sure people have already nitpicked the hell out of, but I am happy people like it so much, and even more so that Zack Snyder got to make the movie he originally wanted to. So good on you, King. Romanoff? You and Banner better not be playing hide the zucchini. The first of our many Marvel movies, I had a bit of a toss up between putting this or the Snyder Cut higher, but the deciding factor for me was that Black Widow is not four hours long. Natasha hasn't ever really been a character I've cared about all that much in previous films, but I think this movie made me really like her and I can't wait to see her in more- For some reason, I thought this was going to be John Wick with Nicolas Cage, and I spent nearly the entire runtime trying to figure out where I got that idea from. Pig is not at all what I was expecting, it's more of a solemn and mature journey about grief, and I definitely felt the film's sadness by the end of it. It's much more of a personal and arguably realistic take on a familiar premise, and it's intentionally unsatisfying to the viewer in a way that makes it more rewarding with what it leaves you to think about. I'm not usually a fan of Nicolas Cage's insane method of acting, but I thought he and everyone else was excellent in this. I also love that Pig doesn't spoon feed you information and you kind of have to work things out on your own. You find out so much about the characters by what they show you instead of outright tell you. The editing is also occasionally funny with how they abruptly cut to the next scene. Was definitely needed amidst all of this depressing self-reflection. I think I just spent too much of the movie anticipating it to be something else that it hindered my experience of the majority of it. So I think that'll easily be fixed the next time I see it now that I know what to expect. Don't come to my house or else I'll suck your dick out of blood. I just want to state that for the record, I don't like vampires. Vampires are lame and I find absolutely nothing intriguing about them. Oh wow, they're really hot and sleep a lot, okay? Join the club. That being said, Night Teeth is a movie that, while not my pick, I ended up really enjoying because of how gorgeously shot it is and how much I enjoyed the performance of the lead characters. I don't really know what it did exactly to make me engage with this modern day vampire stuff that I would normally find unbelievably uninteresting, but I thought the presentation was so slick that I was able to enjoy it regardless. My biggest gripe really was just that the ending was a bit, unfortunately, too in line with what I expect out of a vampire movie, but otherwise this was surprisingly great. But don't think I'm warming up to vampires anytime soon, okay? <laughs> I haven't been caught up on any of the other animated DC movies this year after being traumatized by Apocalypse War, which put me off them for a while, but I came across this one on Netflix and was in the mood for something short, and I'm really happy I did. Batman Soul of the Dragon had a lot of Saturday morning cartoon vibes, and I really dug that about it. The fight scenes are terrific as they usually are with these animated ones, and I had a great time with the story. I was just surprised that Batman actually kind of sticks out amidst all of this martial arts stuff, with his costume looking almost ridiculous by comparison with everyone else, but I think that made it even more charming for me. Long ago. Go. The four nations lived together in harmony. With Raya and the Last Dragon, I loved exploring the world and going on the journey it takes you on with an excellent score and enjoyable characters. I did not expect a Disney animated movie to have fight scenes that go as hard as they do here. Plus the visuals are amazing obviously, but I mean that's kind of the given with these at this point. Raya just fell short for me with the humor, which was a bit distracting and took me out of it every now and then. I don't mean to sound like a dick, but like every time the dragon spoke, it just went on forever and grinds everything to a halt. God, I did not like that dragon. Wow. The French Dispatch was my very first time seeing Wes Anderson on the big screen, and it becomes even easier to appreciate how detailed and incredible the visuals are in, like, every single frame. Unlike his other works I've seen, this one is a collection of three different stories that I have to say I think gradually lost my interest the more they went on. I didn't think any of them weren't great, but the first one was definitely a lot more engaging than the ones that followed on from it. Because of how fast-paced and quick-witted Wes Anderson's dialogue is, I genuinely found that if I missed even a single line, I got a bit lost as to what was going on, and found the second story especially difficult to follow because of that. But I like watching his movies anyway, because they make me feel smart and sophisticated, and not like all I watch otherwise are Marvel movies. I thought the framing device 
guest was unique and everyone in this very stacked cast did a great job. It's a Wes Anderson movie. What do you expect? <laughs> I saw that a lot of people weren't very fond of Don't Breathe 2, which I can totally understand if you've seen the first movie. It's probably up there with one of the most unnecessary sequels ever made, especially for one that has next to nothing to do with the first one. It's super bleak and gritty, and I did like that about it, and there's a lot of really cool shots in here, but it does go for more action than horror for the most part. I think some took issue with the film making you follow such a horrible person, but it never really felt like it was making you root for him in any way. I feel like you can have a protagonist that's awful and shitty, and it was more about watching a bad person and go up against other bad people. Kind of like the first one, but a little bit more extreme. I've made a severe and continuous lapse in my judgment. Mainstream premiered at a film festival in 2020, so Google is going to tell you that this one is not a 2021 <laughs> film, but normal people who aren't rich enough to fly out to random festivals couldn't see it until May last year, so I'm counting it, all right? I feel like every year I only have it in me to tolerate the secondhand embarrassment of watching one movie about YouTube and social media, last year's wow. being Spree, because I find it easier to sleep at night pretending that the film industry doesn't know about how embarrassing we are, just as I used to sleep better not knowing where the gravy came from at KFC. Andrew Garfield is so talented that he somehow made me absolutely fucking hate him by the time this movie was over. He basically just plays Logan Paul, now that I think about it. Maya Hawke as the lead is also fantastic, and I really want to see her in more things. She is wonderful. I think the goal of this film is to provide a scathing critique of toxic internet personalities, complete with their annoying as shit editing and how eventual corporate involvement makes everything worse. But then it sort of rewards the very creators it's making fun of by actually putting them in the movie. And what I'm saying is that it's not fair that Jake Paul gets to share a room with Andrew Garfield and I don't, unless they were asked to come on without knowing that they were being made fun of, which is actually kind of brilliant. The Last Duel was another one where avoiding the marketing gave me the complete wrong impression about what it was about, but that was actually for the better in this case. I admit, I spent about the first third of the movie having no idea what was going on, but it uses this creative structure to help you put all of the pieces together to form this really powerful story. I thought this one would be more action focused, and while the battle scenes are incredibly well done, it's more about the different perspectives of the characters, so I am very glad I didn't end up taking my mum to see this like I was going to originally. Along with Andrew Garfield, Adam Driver is another one of my favourite actors, who were able to make me despise them this year with their roles. But where this is otherwise a very grim and depressing film, at least there's Ben Affleck having the time of his life. Cunt. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. I wasn't aware that there were going to be any horror elements in Last Night in Soho, which was the last thing I was expecting out of an Edgar Wright movie. That definitely caught me off guard, though I do think they were the weakest part of this film. It is neat that he was trying something different though, when nearly every other aspect of this is still great. It goes about a unique way of telling its story by making you very afraid of one of the scariest horror villains ever put to film. British people. I was invested in it for the most part, but I just really wasn't a fan of the ending. The third act had some moments I thought were a bit too silly to overlook. This is one that is greatly enhanced by seeing it in the cinema, the scenes set in past London looked and sounded spectacular. And it sounds like a weird thing to compliment, but the dancing scenes were a huge highlight, and I think that's where Edgar Wright's style shone through the most. Though it does feel strangely absent for the rest of it. This and Wrath of Man were making 2021 the year where films made by directors with usually very prominent styles made movies that feel absolutely nothing like them. If nobody got me, I know Wes Anderson got me. My bussy is shaking. <laughs> <laughs> I've mentioned before my immense dislike of musicals, but there was no way I was going to pass on the chance to see Andrew Garfield sing. I'd never heard of Jonathan Larson before Tick Tick Boom, and getting to become so invested in his story and learn all about his life's work was amazing. Even if theatre isn't something I'm interested in myself, seeing the process and the amount of work put into it definitely made me appreciate it more. I just love watching movies about people working toward their dreams, and it really inspires me as someone who spends all day watching Netflix movies. The songs just still weren't for me, so that's the only reason I'm putting it a bit lower, but everything is Aside from that, was really well done. It got me pretty emotional by the end, and Andrew Garfield is just so good at everything I could watch him forever. That was too close. You were almost a Jill sandwich. The most I've played of Resident Evil was like 30 minutes of the PS4 remake, so I'm not too familiar with the specifics of what was changed in Welcome to Raccoon City, but from what I did recognize, I thought it was clever how they were able to combine elements from both the first and second games into one film. I've never seen any of the other live-action Resident Evil movies either, but from what I have seen, it looks like anything would be an improvement. I love the way this was shot, and they did a great job of making Raccoon City look atmospheric. This was made on a much smaller budget than the others, so I think it's really impressive what they were 
were able to do here. The only real issue I had is that this movie has like 15 million jump scares. It actually has so many that I somehow became desensitized to them while watching it, which has never happened to me before. I really hope they do more of these reboot films because this feels like it was made with a lot of care and it seems like they know what they're doing this time for the most part. Hey, if we can have like 50 million of these. Oh, and I especially love the cast and I thought that a... Uh, Oh no. Yeah, so anyway, this one sucked. <laughs> right, everyone? It's about drive, it's about power. We stay hungry, we do. I enjoyed Jungle Cruise way more than I probably should have. I watched it during the phase where I'm laughing at every single rock meme I come across, so that probably didn't help. But whereas usually he plays this bland action hero, here he is this snarky and sarcastic character. Along with the rest of the trio, with Emily Blunt and Jack Whitewall, who all bounce off each other really well, the cast are a huge part of what made this so enjoyable. It is still a Disney movie, though, so there's a couple grown worthy moments in there, but for the most part, it got a lot crazier and more enjoyable than I was expecting. And please know that I laughed at every single pun. With time loops and coming of age romance films being possibly my two favorite things ever, and the map of tiny perfect things being a great combination of both, I have been genetically predisposed to adore this movie. The premise of the two of them having to look for perfect moments in a day is really sweet, and I love the idea of a relationship developing through an infinite loop, and seeing all the different things they try to break free of it are pretty unique and ones I actually haven't seen tried before. It's really cute and romantic with a fantastic soundtrack and lovable main characters, and they mention Edge of Tomorrow, so great film. I don't like sand. Dune is a hard one for me to talk about because as it tells you in like the opening two seconds, it's only part one of a complete story. I can see why this is getting so much praise. It's visually incredible and has an amazing soundtrack and it feels like something I should have been really invested in. But as someone who is not at all familiar with the book that it's based on, which I'm sure you're sick of me saying by this point, it just took a really long time for me to follow what was going on. And by the time I started getting into it, it just ends. Now that I've read the Wikipedia synopsis 15 times and almost know what a... Bene... Yes. I do feel like I appreciate the story more. I just wish I had understood all that while watching it. And I'm not sure whether the movie doesn't explain things very well or I'm just a bad listener. I think if I was to rewatch it now knowing what the fuck was happening, I'd enjoy it a lot more. And if anything now, I really want to see more from the story and I'm almost disappointed that the movie felt as short as it did. Me saying it feels incomplete is not a criticism by any means. I just think it'll be easier to appreciate with hindsight in like five years. I recall seeing this tweet that said there was only one joke in the whole movie, which is not true. There were at least four, and they were great. Does- does this count? <laughs> I mean, it's movie length. In 2019, my brother held me at gunpoint every day after school to sit through all 236 episodes of Friends, and it was actually pretty good. Or maybe that's the Stockholm Syndrome talking. And even as someone who didn't grow up with the series, it felt really special in Friends the Reunion getting to see the whole cast together in the same room again. The behind the scenes stuff and getting to hear all about the making of the show from the creators themselves was super insightful. I'm just disappointed and even a bit frustrated that they felt the need to pad the runtime with unnecessary celebrity cameos and other random shit as if the Friends cast wasn't enough. Like they relegate important side characters to a brief cameo to make room for BTS and David Beckham because that's who I'm watching this for. And are you seriously telling me they were able to get a hold of Justin Bieber but not Danny DeVito or Paul Rudd? Also, the literal second James Corden appeared on screen, I have never felt so much agony in my life, but I really appreciated that they kept interrupting him before he could try and be funny. Right then. Combat time! No. Look, I was having fun with the movie adaptions for games I don't even play, okay? Sue me. Mortal Kombat was one of my favorite cinema experiences last year. I saw it with a group of friends and I think I was the one that loved it the most. To get it out of the way, the largest issue is obviously with Warner Brothers forcefully shoving in their OC Cole Young, who feels like a very unnecessary addition to a cast of already established characters. I didn't think he was that bad, but I for sure understand where all the negativity is coming from. I'm not that oblivious. But even though I wasn't a fan of the main character, I enjoyed the hell out of the rest of the film. The fight scenes are awesome and it was way funnier than I was expecting, thanks entirely in part to Kano. I feel like having the main protagonist of the movie being the worst part of it should have been a more glaring issue to me, but I had so much fun with everything else that I think it didn't matter too much in the end. And it's awesome to see a higher budget R-rated film like this contain the violence that Mortal Kombat needs. However, there was no techno music for the fight, so that means this one is still objectively not as good as the 1995 movie. Sorry guys, try again next time. We live in a society. I most assuredly could not blame you for thinking that Don't Look Up is one of the least subtle movies of all time, but when you think about how fucking stupid real life issues have gotten, I don't really think there's a need for subtlety anymore. I found this both pretty funny from all of the little running gags and the terrific performances from Leo and Jennifer, but also genuinely a bit scary with how accurately they hit some of the points on the head. Like for the most part while I was watching it, I found it pretty enjoyable and a nice distraction from the outside world, but eventually it just left me feeling really depressed. 
So thanks, Adam McKay. You As to be expected from a Pixar film, Luca is fantastic. I love the characters so much. It's such a cute, smaller scale story in a vibrant and colorful setting. And as much as I initially wasn't a fan of the sea monster world stuff, it didn't become as prominent in the movie the longer it goes on. I'd also love to say the animation looked incredible and appreciate how much work was put in by the animators, but fucking Disney Plus buffered every two seconds and dropped the quality down to 240p. Like, are you fucking kidding me, dude? I get better quality if I pirated it. What happened to Blink Went, would you? I watched season one of Netflix's The Witcher last year, and as much as I love buff Henry Cavill, I just couldn't really get into it. But this was way more up my alley. I think the monsters and magic abilities work a lot more effectively in animation, like cartoon animation, because it's not like they're real in the show. And on top of that, the action and gore is unbelievably good here. You have both a brutal fantasy film and a touching love story all in one. The pacing feels very fast, but not to the point where I couldn't enjoy the story, and the main cast were all really hot and charming and hot. I did have a problem with some of the dialogue though, because sometimes it's quieter than the music, which made things a bit hard to follow at times. I don't know if that was just me. I was genuinely thinking this was the same animation studio that did Castlevania, but apparently it's not. Though they're very much in the same style in terms of what I love about them. And as someone who really hates kids, I'm really happy we got a movie for us this year. All right, now we're finally getting to the top 10. With Black Widow kind of coming out right in the middle of my Marvel fatigue, it was Shang-Chi that reminded me of why I love these movies in the first place. A lot of people praise the fight choreography in this and for very good reason. Each bit of action felt super unique and expertly put together. And man, did they somehow make those rings the coolest shit ever. The only thing I wasn't a fan of was a bit later in the third act, which I felt was a bit unnecessary, but it is very in line with Marvel movies to have a gratuitous finale for no reason. And it wasn't enough to take away from the better parts of the film for me. And as it turns out, Aquafina is a lot more enjoyable to watch when she's not an annoying talking dragon. Hi, I'm Saul Goodman. Did you know that you have rights? With there not being another John Wick coming out for at least another... <laughs> <laughs> two years. Nobody was there to scratch that itch for me by being a badass action film that I am very sure will be a huge hit with middle-aged dads. Bob Odenkirk makes for a fantastic action hero and I loved him in this. Though what stood out to me initially was that the action scenes felt quite realistic and impactful. I guess 2021 is just the year of really good bus fight scenes. Though gradually they do descend into more cartoonish over-the-top territory, which I was also perfectly fine with. Nobody's a lot of fun and knowing now that the director is the same guy that made Hardcore Henry, it explains a lot. Well, this was fucking weird. David Lowry, the director of The Green Knight, also did a film called A Ghost Story that was one of my absolute favorite movies I saw last year. I understand why his style isn't for everyone, but I personally adore the shit out of it. It is intentionally slow, and there's a lot of long, unbroken shots that are left there to linger and resonate with you. And there's also giant naked people and a talking CGI fox, so... You know, it's something for everyone. I think the A24 logo at the beginning must have been a mistake though, because I actually understood what was going on. The Green Knight feels like a series of loosely tied together vignettes, but each one is so unique. It's visually stunning and leaves you with a lot to think about what it all meant, because so much is left ambiguous. Which meant that I went straight onto YouTube to explain what the fuck I just watched. <laughs> A Quiet Place Part 2 is everything I wanted from a sequel to the first, which did an amazing job with its world building, and they keep it up here even with a much bigger and broader setting. The flashback scenes were a huge highlight of course, and I'm very glad they were, because I swear they were the only thing they showed in like every single trailer. I also found a quote from the marketing that says that, this is the experience that theaters are made for, to which I would like to politely offer my rebuttal. I just want to say that I hate every single person in my cinema who chose to buy popcorn that day. Wow, the movie is called A Quiet Place, so I better turn the cinema into the loudest fucking place on earth. Ghostbusters Afterlife was one of the very last films I saw on this list, so there might be a little bit of recency bias here. Initially, I was worried the new cast were going to be super annoying, but almost immediately, I became really fond of them. The standout obviously being Egon's granddaughter. I mean, that's just incredible casting. It's really obvious this was made with a lot of love and passion, with them even using some practical effects, which was a surprise. It's a really great mixture of older and newer material that feels right at home alongside the other two movies. But between this and A Quiet Place, I'm beginning to never want to go to a cinema ever again. There was this freaking seven-year-old kid sitting next to me in the theater who was rustling this candy packet for the entire two hours. So I had to listen to this for the entire movie and oh my fucking god. 
Top five, almost there, guys. Bo Burnham's inside is probably the first time I have laughed through an existential crisis. It is absolutely incredible what he was able to accomplish all by himself, and it's both extremely funny and very emotional. Bo hits on the head a lot of the things I think most of us have been feeling about both the pandemic and just life in general lately. There's only a few bits in there that I wasn't a fan of, but it stuck with me even though I saw it about a month ago now. Inside feels like it's three hours long, which is the first time I mean that as a compliment. Oh, and the songs are obviously great as well. I've listened to about half the soundtrack on Spotify enough to the point where I now hate them. Being the fourth and final rebuild of Evangelion, I expected Thrice Upon a Time to deliver on gorgeous animation, but an equal amount of unbelievably convoluted story, which is... Yeah, pretty much exactly what I got. Like, I have absolutely no idea what I even watched, but I am fairly sure I enjoyed it. I think? I'm at the point where I think I'm comfortable with not entirely understanding everything Evangelion is about. And regardless, this is both a satisfying conclusion to both the rebuild films that I've been watching since 2010, and just the series as a whole. There's a lot of terrific slice of life stuff in there as well, which I was not expecting, but plenty of the completely nonsensical action that I've come to love from these films. After it was in development for like 27 years, I still can't believe this is actually out. And though I spent most of the runtime being extremely confused, by the time the ending kicks in, I was like, yeah. This is great. Even if 90% of it made absolutely zero sense and probably still wouldn't even after watching 20 videos on YouTube trying to explain it, I loved it as both a standalone movie and as an ending to this extremely confusing series that I don't think even Hideaki Anno understands anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, the weekend. No Time to Die is another one that feels like it had been in development since the beginning of time, and I'm very happy to say it was absolutely worth the wait. They did a lot of things in this one I never thought they ever would with Bond, and each of the action set pieces are distinct and really well done, and it packed more of an emotional punch than I was prepared for, I'll say that much. The weakest part is easily Rami Malek's villain. What was his name? Lucifer Satan. <laughs> he felt like he was kind of absent for a lot of the film and so lacks the build up to make him as impactful as I think they wanted him to be. In hindsight, it was definitely a poor decision to not rewatch the other movies before this one because there were certain elements and characters I didn't remember at all. You can definitely argue that some of the previous Craig films had stronger aspects like Skyfall's gorgeous visuals and Casino Royale having a scene where James gets his fucking nuts smashed in. But for being the very last time we're going to see Daniel Craig as James Bond, I don't think I could have asked for a better send off for him. This is good. Katana, she's got my back. The Suicide Squad had a very big reputation to live up to, and I can't believe it somehow managed to be even better than that. James Gunn just makes these characters so much fun to watch, and where otherwise I think they'd be kind of obnoxious and one note, here they're also memorable and hilarious, and I even came to care about a lot of them by the end. There's a lot of cool visuals and editing that gives it this high energy that I think really helps make it as fun as it is. It's also relentlessly funny, I was losing it to more than one line in this thing, and I think nearly every joke landed. I don't know how they only got away with an MA rating here though, because this is way more violent than some R18 movies I've seen. I guess they saw the bipedal shark man and were like, yeah, it's probably fine. And now, after all this incoherent rambling, my number one movie of the year is... The Boss Baby Family Business. Ah, <laughs> you didn't see that coming. Best movie of the year. No, it, it's, it's Spider-Man. Yeah, I know. What an extremely shocking and surprising pick for number one, huh? I know it's not really all that fair to compare this massive multi-billion dollar franchise movie against some of these other smaller scale projects, but I don't care. I didn't just love No Way Home for the familiar faces appearing from past films. I think on its own, Peter's development is at its best here, and there's so many emotional moments that hit extremely hard. I adore these Tom Holland Spider-Man movies. They're my favorite take on the character by far, but this one just blew me away with how cohesive they were able to make it. Like, they balance so many characters and plot threads from previous movies, not even just in the MCU, and yet it all feels like such a personal journey for Peter. I don't know how they're ever gonna top this, but I legitimately hope they just keep making these forever. Sony might not know what they're doing with their own standalone films or with their fucking awful posters, but with these MCU Spider-Man movies, they just continue to knock it out of the park. I know it's a boring pick for number one, but I loved it too much to not put it here, so I hope you'll forgive me for skipping out on Sing 2 this year, because we all know that would have been the real number one pick. Now, before we wrap things up for good, because I'm sure you must be unbelievably sick of me talking by now, I'm going to very quickly run through all the 2021 shows I saw last year, which I'm going to be a lot briefer with, thank god. As someone who has never and will never touch League of Legends, Arcane completely blew me away in every aspect. Everything from the characters to the animation was incredible. It's easily my favorite show of the year. Unfortunately, Imagine Dragons is in it, so that's going to be a negative four stars from me. I'm very sad to see Castlevania go after being one of my favorite shows for like four years now, and while I think the final season does get off to a bit of a rough start, I think by the end they were able to pull off a spectacular conclusion to a series I'm going to miss very much. After Infinity Train became another of my favorite shows last year, I have to say I was a little underwhelmed with 
book four, and I'm unbelievably upset to find out this is probably the last time we'll ever see this show. Fuck you, HBO. Invincible is some very good shit, some very disturbing, horrifying shit. Say what you want about Infinite Darkness, but the one-liners in it are fucking incredible. Some of the four live action Marvel shows that came out last year that I inadvertently watched all of, I thought WandaVision had a very strong start, but gradually lost my interest as they kept over explaining everything that made the first three episodes so good. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier I thought was okay, but was probably my least favorite, but my brother's immense hatred of John Walker made it way more entertaining. Loki was the one I was least excited for and yet ended up being one of the best, but my absolute favorite had to be Hawkeye at the very last minute, which not only finally got me to care about Clint after all this time, but also has Haley Stein felt in it, so that's like four stars on its own. I've gone my whole life thinking He-Man is the silliest shit ever, but Masters of the Universe Revelation is an awesome and heartfelt journey, and also has a guy called Fistor who keeps saying he wants to fist people. You gotta have like a freaking PhD to understand the plot of Singular Point. What the fuck was going on? With season two of Love, Death and Robots, I only enjoyed about half the episodes this time, with my favorites being In the Tall Grass and Pop Squad, which gave me a new dream job. Okay, all memes aside, the first six episodes of Squid Game are genuinely some of the best television I have ever scene, but it just completely fell apart for me with the remainder of it because it has one of the worst endings I've ever seen in a while, and also because they bring in these fucking <laughs> VIPs that come in and completely ruin the tension by going, uh -huh. uh, penis 69 penis. Uh -huh. Star Wars Visions is amazing, I just wish I had known there was an option to watch it in Japanese beforehand. Kingdom was definitely a part of the War for Cybertron trilogy. I don't know how, but Studio Trigger can do no wrong. Mostly. I don't even know why I'm watching Rick and Morty anymore. Pacific Rim the Black was a huge surprise because after the shit show that was Uprising, I'd lost hope in them ever making anything worthwhile out of Pacific Rim. Looking forward to season two before Netflix cancels it in favor of 12 more Big Mouth seasons. I was under the impression that Comey Sam was a super wholesome feel-good show, and while it does have some really cute moments, some of the humor and fan service are a bit too extreme for me, and I hope this character fucking dies. And with that, we're done. Woo! Thank you all very much for watching this extremely overlong video. I hope you enjoyed me rambling about movies for like an hour and happy new year. It's, it's still January, right?